I've been around here long enough to know the uh, format for how you introduce the opening night keynote. I'm supposed to say that I am honored, um, privileged, grateful, humbled to be given this opportunity. Uh, I would like to be able to say that, but uh, I must say I'm probably more befuddled and perplexed. Uh, when Mike first came to me and he said, I have this terrific idea for lectureship next year, what do you think of this? I would like to do the five scrolls, the Megilot in the Old Testament. My field's Old Testament, I thought, sounds pretty good. This idea has potential. And then he said, and I think you would be good to keynote to open the series. And I thought, well, this is becoming less attractive. And then he said, and I have this truly terrific idea, I would like you to open Tuesday night and keynote with the Song of Songs. Now, at that point I did have a number of thoughts that went through my mind, but the one I expressed was, you know, do you have a rationale for that? And his rationale was, oh, the place will be packed. People will be dying to come hear what you have to say about sex. Now, I got to tell you, I mean, if people will pack this place for a train wreck. I'm not sure that's a good idea. And so we began to talk about this. And I got to tell you, I'm pretty hyper rational. And so the way I make decisions is I literally sometimes put on paper, draw a line down the middle, and I put good idea, bad idea, uh, advantages, disadvantages, you know, what's right, what's wrong. And usually in doing that, it becomes pretty clear which way I think I ought to go. This one, everything was in the, this is a bad idea column. <laughs> one person sitting there thinking this is a good idea, and yet here I am in front of you this evening. And so I will tell you, um, I am wearing a suit. It is intentional. If this goes badly tonight, I am already dressed for job searching tomorrow morning. <laughs> so we're good to go, folks. Now. I was kind of stuck, and so I thought I would go to someone who, for 44 years, has probably year in, year out, day in, day out, given me incredibly good advice, and that is my wife, Paula. And so I went home and I said, this is Mike's idea, and this is what he has requested for my part in it. And her response, well, her response after she sort of picked herself up off the floor laughing, you know, from he'd like you to talk about sex was, uh, and tell me how he thinks this is a good idea. And I said, well, it's, it's not really clear. And she said, you know, is this your choice if you were going to deliver one of the keynotes on these five books? And I said, no, I would pick Ruth. <laughs> I mean, I got to tell you folks, Ruth practically preaches itself. And she said, that's a good idea. Who's preaching Ruth? And I said, Mike. <laughs> you know, I mean, really. Now, this is the way I think lectureship directors should work. Lectureship directors, arguably the best preacher in the room, should take last choice and have the most difficult task. He has taken first choice. Apparently, we didn't discuss that in the negotiations. And so here we are. And so I had one final question. I thought, surely, Mike, he's a bright guy. What's plan B? And I said, so if I don't do this, who is plan B? And he said, I will get Randy Harris to deliver it. <laughs> okay, now, I'm trying to take this as a compliment. My knowledge of marital bliss is one notch above a self-proclaimed monk. <laughs> Could be worse, folks, could be worse, but we're there, okay? Now, I started thinking, I, I tried to count up, you know, how many sermons in my life I have preached on the Song of Psalms, on the Song of Songs. Now, you got to realize, my field is education, not the pulpit. It's the classroom. And I have preached somewhere between one and zero sermons, okay? <laughs> I have taught this material a ton of times. In fact, I got to tell you, Religion 101, this is always the last day of class. This is the book we cover, and I simply walk in and start reading. <laughs> and students who have quit bringing Bibles weeks earlier are scrambling to find Bibles. I mean, I could make a fortune just selling Bibles. There is nothing like getting 18-year-olds to read the Bible than reading the Song of Songs. And so it is a powerful message. Um, I mean, in a very real sense, we look at this passage and we grapple with this book. 
and we wonder why. And so listen to the word of the Lord in Song of Songs, chapter 8. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is strong as death, passion fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, a raging flame. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If one offered for love all the wealth of one's house, it would be utterly scorned. It was a Sunday evening at church, and we had decided we would take turns or have people in our congregation talk about their spouses and the first time they met. And so George stood before us and talked as only a newlywed could talk about the first time he met and saw his bride. He was working for a tech company in Washington, D.C. It was a blind date, I believe, and there she was at the top of the stairs. And as she came down, and he began to describe in detail, as only a newlywed could, the fitted white sweater she was dressing, what her face looked like, her hair, how she walked, and when he met her, how she talked. And it was mesmerizing until his bride, Nina, said, George, knock it off. This is embarrassing. Because George was 75 years old, and they had been married for 50 years. <laughs> and he still saw her the way he saw her that first day. And I remember sitting there thinking, you don't need to knock this off. This is fascinating, because even I, with my faulty memory, can still remember when at Abilene Christian, I walked into freshman English, dreaded freshman English, thinking I got to do this one more time, and thinking this is going to be miserable, a waste of time, and then looked across the room, and there she was. And to this day, I can tell you what Paula looked like, her hair, her face, what she was wearing, as I thought there may be some serendipitous ray of hope, even in English 101. <laughs> and Song of Songs traffics in that world. But Nina's comment to George was prescient, if not insightful. Because there is an irony, is there not, that many of us find this more awkward to discuss and talk about healthy sexual relationships, about marital fidelity, and about loyalty than unhealthy relationships, about illicit affairs, and about adultery. And we live in a world where psychologists spend far more time studying unhealthy characteristics and maladjusted people than talking about the characteristics of healthy people and well-adjusted people. And the biblical materials that come at us, if we are familiar with them, we know they traffic in powerful communication techniques because one of the things the biblical writers do so well is use images and analogies and metaphors from our daily world, relationships from our daily world, to describe our relationship between God, our Father, and us. And so those of us who know Scripture, even at a passing level, know well the story of God entering Egypt and rescuing his people and taking them through the Red Sea and bringing them to Sinai and entering into a covenant with them and taking them through the desert as that first generation died off and the children grew up and then taking them into the land only to find that they went after the Baals. And those of us who are better versed or well versed in scripture know how that story is personalized in relationships. We know that in many places in the Bible, it is talked about God going to Egypt and wooing his bride and bringing her out, delivering her at the Red Sea and bringing her to Mount Sinai and entering into a marriage covenant. We even, if we are well versed, know the vows. I will be your God, your only God, and you will be my only people. And you will have no other gods besides me. And we know the honeymoon period 
is really the way the wilderness or the desert is described. And we know that in the prophets, the entrance into the land and going after the Baals is described as adultery, as prostituting themselves and walking away from their partner, God. And so it is ironic, I think, that probably we have people sitting here uncomfortable tonight that we are going to talk about Song of Songs, which talks about healthy relationships and would probably not be uncomfortable if we were talking about Hosea, who has a disastrous personal life that reflects the relationship of God and his people, or Jeremiah, who can be graphic about the relationship between the people and the Baals, or Ezekiel. And yet somehow Song of Songs is a book we're not quite sure what to do with. And so we grapple with it. It wasn't always that way. We live in a world where we are comfortable talking about good relationships gone bad. Tonight we are going to talk about good relationships gone good. And it's interesting if you look at the different times how things play out. Again, it wasn't always this way. In the Middle Ages, if you were asked what book of the Bible had more commentaries written on it than any other book, you might be surprised to know Song of Songs. More than 30 commentaries written on that book, more than any other book in the Bible. Much earlier, Origen had 10 volumes worth of sermons. Three volumes were on Song of Songs. I do not know how to explain that. And he never got to the end of chapter 2. Bernard de Clairvaux later, one of the great monks, has 86 sermons on the Song of Songs and never got out of chapter 2. I mean, that's mind-boggling, I think, to a lot of us. And yet, here we are in this moment. Luther, the educator, had 24 class lectures on Song of Songs. I have one. It works, but I have one. And so for many of us, Song of Songs is unfamiliar terrain because it is terrain that is not about the lament of love lost or the condemnation of distorted relationships. It is really the celebration of healthy, vibrant relationships between a man and a woman. And for some reason, that is unfamiliar terrain in the biblical materials for a lot of us. In fact, if we talk about Song of Songs at all, in my experience in Bible classes, the question is, what in the world is this book doing in the Bible? Now, what I want to suggest tonight is that if this book suffers from lack of familiarity, it is built off of, and the text that it is rooted in is a passage that, if anything, for many of us, suffers from too much familiarity, and that is Genesis 2. Genesis 2, that passage that is known to virtually all of us, but so familiar that I think sometimes we miss some of the most powerful points in it. So think about Genesis 1 and 2. I mean, we all know that. We've heard it since, since we were in Sunday school, right? Genesis 1 gives you the grandeur and the majesty of the universe. It's looking at creation through a telescope. And then you come to chapter 2, and chapter 2 really sort of zeroes in on the mystery of the relationships in which we are involved. And it talks at length, or it talks about, the different relationships in which we are involved as humans. Our relationship to the plant world, to the animal world, to each other, and to God. And as you begin to hear that story unfold, it's pretty striking, isn't it? It starts with God in the midst of this vast desert planting this luxuriant garden and realizing someone's got to tend for this thing. It will not take care of itself. And so he creates a human. And this human is unique because this human, unlike the rest of creation, has breathed into him the very breath of God. And so in the first outing, this human finds meaning and he finds relationships. He is given meaning through his work, through his vocation. He takes care of, he tends, he cares for the garden. But God quickly realizes that is not enough. Ultimate meaning in life is not simply based on what we do. 
We've got to have relationships. And so God decides to create entities so that this human will have a relationship. And he decides he will create a counterpart to this human, and he begins to create animals. And as he creates these animals, he brings them to this man, and he lets the man name them. And so if we are listening closely, we suddenly realize this human now has at least two relationships. He has his relationship with God, in which God is the superior and he is the inferior. And now he has this relationship with the animals in which clearly he is the superior and the animals are the inferior because he has named them. He has given them their identity just as God is his superior by planting the garden, by giving him his identity. But as we are told, there is nothing yet in creation truly his counterpart that truly corresponds to him. And so here again, that familiar passage at the end of Genesis 2. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman. In our world, when you are awestruck, we say you are speechless. In this man's world, he has not yet spoken. When he is awestruck, he speaks. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. Now, I'm going to assume most of you in here don't know Hebrew, and so let me tell you what this man says. The animals come, come by, and now you have this entity that is created out of him, and when he sees her, he says, wow, now this is what I had in mind. <laughs> now you got it. You didn't know you could say wow in Hebrew. You can say wow in Hebrew. Okay? God has done something that the man clearly realizes is corresponding to him, is his match. And we know that it's different because he even changes the expression when he says, this one shall be called. He uses one way to name the animals. He does not name woman that way. It is not designation, it is exclamation, because he has found his true counterpart. Now, that passage is so familiar to us that I think we miss some of the stunners in it. Think about it. See, I know the way this passage is supposed to read. When you get to the end, what it's supposed to say, therefore, a woman will leave her father and mother and cling to her husband. But this thing has it on its head. Therefore, the man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife. And if that is not stunning enough, no sooner did we get this description about a person being pulled apart and created into two entities, then we are told, and the two become one flesh. I mean, that's mind-boggling if you think about it. We pull them apart and then get a comment about how they become one flesh, and this is the world as God intended it to be. Genesis 2 is creation as God intended. It would be wonderful if the story stopped there. But God created a lot of different types of animals, and so we enter chapter 3, and he apparently created snakes. I grew up in Arizona. I do not know why God created snakes. Wrong person to ask. And here comes the serpent, and the serpent puts a question mark behind that pivotal question. Does God really have your best interests at heart? Does God really have the goods to be the superior and you're the inferior? If you are truly in the image of God, isn't there something you can eat or do or drink or learn that would make God unnecessary and you could be your own God? 
and suddenly everything comes open. That was the ultimate seduction in Genesis chapter 3. It continues to be the ultimate seduction today. Isn't there something we can learn or know that will make God unnecessary and we can decide for ourselves what is best for us, what is good and what is bad, what is beneficial and what is harmful? And they take from the tree, they saw that it was desired and they ate. And all these relationships from chapter 2 are ruptured. The relationship that they have with God, the relationship that the man and the woman have with each other, no longer is tending the garden as simple as picking fruit to eat. Now they've got to work through the grisly chore of getting rid of the thorns and thistles, planting the wheat, and harvesting and grinding the grain. And the world becomes a dangerous place. And in a world where humans decide they have the potential to be their own gods, not surprisingly, power comes into play. And so we begin to get power terminology. And we get the language that the woman's desire will be for her husband and he will rule over her. And in that battle, there will be winners and there will be losers. Sadly, I think if we're honest with ourselves, often we have become more accustomed and more comfortable with the world of Genesis 3 than the world of Genesis 2. And it's because of that, perhaps, that we are more at home reading Hosea and Jeremiah and Ezekiel than we are reading the Song of Songs. Because the Song of Songs grows out of Genesis 2 rather than Genesis 3. Now, if you'll allow me that premise, let's work our way through a bit the Song of Songs and take a look at it because of that. Amazingly, Karl Barth referred to the Song of Songs as the Magna Carta of human sexuality. It's kind of mind-boggling if you think about it. This book we never read, the Magna Carta of human sexuality. Now, you have to understand, this is a collection of lyrical love poems. At face value, it's, these are love poems or love songs that kind of flesh out or elaborate what the Genesis 2 relationship might look like. And so in the Song of Songs, you're returned and you hear a lot about gardens and about flocks and about trees and about uh, vineyards. That's the world that it is presupposing. And it talks quintessentially about healthy relationships. It talks about what it looks like when two people are fully in love with each other and fully invested in each other. And while we may spend time wondering how this collection of love poems or love songs became part of Scripture, that was never a question for early believers. Because they knew this was called the Song of Songs, which in Hebrew is the way you say the greatest song. They argued about whether Ezekiel or Ecclesiastes or James or Hebrews should be in Scripture, but not the Song of Songs. It was there. And so again, at face value, it's a collection of lyrical poetry. It celebrates the love between a man and a woman. And then if you want, we can argue about is it presupposing a wedding? And these are wedding songs sung throughout the week. Who are the identity of the individuals? How do we figure that out? But I would suggest that at base we remember this is more like a, po a portrait than a photograph. It is more a painting than an actual description. That allows us then to realize why in this description the groom can refer to his bride as more lovely than any queen or maiden in the royal retinue, and the, the bride can talk about her groom as someone more impressive and more prestigious and more royalty than even Solomon himself. Because this is the world seen through the eyes of love. And it's because of that that not surprisingly, these lyrical love poems easily, to some, gave themselves to a symbolic reading. 
It wasn't, first and foremost, an attempt to engage in flights of fancy, although that did happen, but it was really an attempt to say, if this is what love looks like in the human realm, what does love look like in God's relationship to us? A God who is fully invested in us, a God who cares for us, a God who would give himself completely to us. And so many took a both-and approach, that it was talking about love at the human level, between a man and a woman, and it could be talked about symbolically at the divine human level. And so there are, if we think about that, there are some bigger things that I think are worth noting. Let's try a few. First, um, I think that one of the things you see in this material are the challenges that are often reflected in a love relationship. So in the Song of Songs, one of the challenges this young woman has is she has brothers. Now, half the audience knows exactly what I'm talking about. These brothers are a bit of a problem for her. And interestingly, the brothers think she is sort of a problem that they need to solve. She apparently doesn't share that, but they seem to think that. They live in that patriarchal world. And there are societal challenges. And so as you read through the material, there are moments where she does things that are atypical And because of that, she has to deal with them, but she is undaunted. Twice in the streets, her actions are misinterpreted. Once she is ignored by the watchman, the other time she is abused. But because of her love for her lover, she is undaunted. Because none of these challenges can overcome the power of love because we are told love is as strong as death. It is a flaming torch, it's a flaming inferno that even floods cannot quench. And amazingly, to our society, it even says, even all the money in the world can't detract it, can't buy it off. That's the world that we see in the Song of Songs. Perhaps even more interesting, I, you know, I often ask my students in class, I say, um, tell me what it was like, what do you think it was like to be female in the ancient world? And we get all the stereotypes out on the board, and many of them are legitimate. But virtually none of them ever talk about how women are understood in the Song of Songs or in other passages of Scripture. They seldom talk about Proverbs 31 or Esther or Ruth. And yet, in a very real sense, when you read the Song of Songs, the the bride in the Song of Songs in some ways is a young version of the woman in Proverbs 31, and we dare not forget the woman in Proverbs 31 is described as the ideal woman. And she is as atypical as you would ever want. Or the bride in the Song of Songs are more vocal than the men. Women do far more talking in the Song of Songs than the men do. And in fact, you get fascinating passages. Song of Songs chapter 7 and verse 10. You remember Genesis 3.16? Her desire will be for you and, she will, and he will rule over you. In 7.10 it says, his desire is for her. It flips it on its head. And so this week, we are going to be looking at materials that in a very real sense are atypical. Esther, the story of a woman who is completely powerless, a foreign female in a world of idiots, and she delivers her people. (laughs) Or Ruth, the one who repeatedly is identified as the immigrant, and yet from this immigrant, the greatest king who ever ruled Israel will come. It is a different world than most of us think about day in, day out. But I think most telling and most empowering about the Song of Songs is that it describes and presents for us what healthy human sexual relationships look like. Notice what they look like. Both the bride and the groom talk far more about the other than about themselves. They are completely consumed with the other. And they are focused upon the other. The only time they talk about themselves is when they say, my desire to please the other. That's the only time the personal pronoun comes in in the Song of Songs. It really, in a sense, is a collection of love poems that celebrate mutual admiration. And you see little things. They tease each other. 
Because teasing, apparently, is the mark of a healthy relationship. Making fun of and belittling is an unhealthy relationship. But in the Song of Songs, they love each other and they care for each other. In a very real sense, love in the Song of Songs is not about the clinical techniques of lovemaking. It's about the emotional aspects of love and giving oneself completely to another. And because of that, I think it counters the me culture in which we are surrounded. A culture that talks about my needs and my wants that is given to self-absorption and narcissism and Song of Songs talks about what the world looks like if we were completely given to being concerned for the other, for our spouse. And because of that, it transforms language when we are consumed by the other. If you read it closely, the groom will say that he is captured by the bride. And he willingly surrenders to her. Language that typically is not positive language, but for him, because of his love for her, he can use it in a very positive sense. In a very real sense, in Song of Songs, we get a glimpse of what the world would look like if we lived in the world of Genesis 2 rather than the world of Genesis 3. It is a world that talks about oneness, about being together, about mutuality, about what it means to have a community. It is a world where there is no blame. Because no one in this world is striving to be God. Now, if that was not surprising enough, perhaps the ultimate surprise for many of us is we know that these five scrolls were read at different festival days in ancient Israel. And so they make sense. I mean, Ruth. It makes perfect sense to read Ruth at the festival of Pentecost the close of the Harvest Festival. It makes sense to read Esther at the Festival of Purim. It makes sense to have lamentations, not at a festival, but at a fast. But the shocker is to have the Song of Songs sung at Passover, the greatest festival in Israel's history. And yet if you step back, that's no surprise. What else would you sing Passover celebrates the greatest love story Israel has. The story of the deliverance from Egypt, the rescue through the Red Sea, the coming to Mount Sinai and entering into into relationship with God and him taking his people forth into the promised land. The greatest love story for Jews ever told is the exodus from Egypt, the Passover story. And so why would you not sing the greatest love songs ever written at the festival of the greatest love story. Now, that's marvelous, but what do we do with that as Christians? How do we understand that as Christians? What does it have to do with us? Because quite frankly, the exodus from Egypt and the Passover is for us the second greatest love story. The greatest love story ever told for us is God's gift of himself through his son Jesus Christ. And yet I would suggest Song of Songs may have more to say to us than we think at first blush. Because a story whose essence is love and whose story for us is not simply love is as strong as death, but love is stronger than death through what God has done in Jesus Christ when he took the stinger out of death. And notice when Jesus says and is asked the truly tough questions about relationships, where does he go? Genesis 2. And so for Jesus, the keystone of his message is the kingdom of God. And what is the essence of the kingdom of God, the demonstration of the kingdom of God? It is God's love for us. And Jesus' followers tweaked that a bit because what they talked about was the incarnate Jesus. And what else was he but the embodiment of God's love? And so a book that celebrates love, healthy love, vibrant love, love that is totally consumed for the other, may be quite relevant and quite important for us. And I would suggest it's no accident that when you hear Paul talking about relationships and when he turns to the relationship between a man and a woman in Ephesians 5, he's in Genesis 2. 
And just like in Song of Songs, as we think about it, it's easy to move back and forth between the love between a husband and a wife and the love of God for us and our love for God in reciprocal fashion. And we move back and forth easily. So when you read Ephesians 5, it is striking how easily Paul seems to move back and forth between a lo the love of a husband and a wife and the love of Christ and his church. In fact, sometimes when you're reading it, you're kind of thinking, okay, which one are you talking about here, Paul? But it's easy for Paul because Paul has cut his teeth on Genesis 2. He knows the ultimate love story that has now been trumped by the love story of Jesus Christ. And so I would suggest that one of the things we do as we read Ephesians 5 is ask ourselves, do we read Ephesians 5 against the backdrop of Genesis 2 or Genesis 3? If we read it against the backdrop of Genesis 2, it's about mutuality and it's about concern for the other and giving ourselves completely to the other. Sometimes we read it against the backdrop of Genesis 3 and we want to argue about the words and what do they really mean and not that those are not important but we want to start saying they're different and once again creating breaks between ourselves and yet I think Paul will have none of that because ultimate love for him is manifested in Jesus Christ who gave himself for the church and so if we read Song of Songs correctly I think we celebrate what it means to truly love, what it means to be loved by God, and how that impacts our love for our spouse, our love for each other. And it goes back and forth. And so let me close with three passages. Genesis chapter 2. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh, and the rib that he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. Song of Songs. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is strong as death, passion fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, a raging flame. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If one offered for love all the wealth of one's house, it would be utterly scorned. And now Ephesians 5. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This is a great mystery, and I am applying it to Christ and the church. Let's stand and sing.